Hello, everyone. Welcome to CAA's Columbia and Home series. We're so glad you've joined us. I'm Donna McPhee, Columbia College grad from the class of 1989 and president of the Columbia Alumni Association. Tonight's program is New Year's planning in uncertain times with Columbia Business School adjunct professor Cheryl Strauss, excuse me, Cheryl Strauss Einhorn. Cheryl is the creator of the area method, a decision making system to solve complex problems. She is the founder of coaching and consulting firm CSE Partners, an education technology company Deci decisive. She's also the author of Problem Solved, a powerful system for making complex decisions with confidence and conviction as well as investing in financial research, a decision-making system for better result. Cheryl has won several journalism awards for investigative stories about international, political, business, and economic topics. Her area method is used across broad domains ranging from low-income high schools to multinational com companies and government agencies. She will be joined in conversation by fellow Columbia Business School adjunct professor, Paul Johnson. Paul runs Nakusa Investment Advisors, an advisory firm focused on helping CEOs and boards of directors deal with operational and financial strategy, shareholder value creation, and corporate communications. At Columbia, Paul has taught over 45 semester long courses on securities analysis and value investing to more than 2,500 full time and executive MBA students. Paul received the Commitment to Excellence Award from the 2016, 2017, and 2019 executive MBA graduating classes in recognition of his outstanding commitment to their educational experience, as well as the Dean's Prize for Teaching Excellence in 2017. Paul is co-author with Paul Sonkin of Pitch the Perfect Investment, The Essential Guide to Winning on Wall Street, published in September 2017. He has an MBA in finance from the executive program at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, and a BA in economics from the University of California, Berkeley. Near the end of the program, we'll have an audience Q&A. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. We'll try to get to as many as we can in the time we have. I'm now pleased to welcome both Cheryl and Paul to Columbia at Home. Enjoy. Cheryl. Good to see you, Paul, and thank you so much for having us tonight. Yeah, th I thank uh, <clears throat> Donna and her whole team at CAA uh, for this great event. All right, this seems to be the year to have this topic, uh, uncertainty, ambiguity, making tough decisions. I mean, it's certainly been a year of surprises, few of which have been positive surprises. Most of them have been really heart-wrenching and negative and difficult and all of that. And then in the midst of that, lots of things going on. So I think this is sort of the perfect time to think about uncertainty. We're rolling to the end of the year. We humans like to sort of think of the year ahead as we get to the first of the new year. So I think the timing of this talk is perfect. Um, in one of your articles, you've written a lot on this topic. Uh, I think your articles are incredibly insightful and offer great clarity, and I want to delve into them tonight, but let's sort of unpack them. But in one of your articles that you published in the Harvard Business Review this year, you, you referenced uh, General Eisenhower and his sort of thought that uh, plans are somewhat useless, but planning is indispensable. Can you kind of help people understand I guess the subtle difference between planning and plans. Absolutely, thank you so much. So the difference is, is that we rarely get to execute the plans that we come up with as we initially intended them to be. But those planning exercises, those are times of critical thinking and they allow us an opportunity to get in better touch with how we're gonna deliver whatever it is that we are working on. And the reason why that's so useful is we get to look at a problem from various aspects 
And then when things don't go, as we initially expected, we generally have a better idea, number one, of what we were aiming for, number two, that we have some common lexicon, a language with our teammates or even our family members on what it is and why we were doing what we were doing. And third, that gives us, therefore, an easier way to transition. And it really is these skills on how to transition where planning becomes so useful because transitioning as human beings is very difficult as we've all seen day in and day out this year in particular. So it sounds like that, it, it, and we're gonna talk about it and unpack it, that the planning process is, is critical, particularly in moments of uncertainty, but that people should definitely not get wedded to the result, that plan. Almost don't hold on to the plan, really think about relish in the planning process. Is that a fair way to think about it? Well, I don't know how many people really relish in the planning process itself, because that takes time and it often takes work. And, um, and most people generally want to go faster. It's not so much that they want to slow down, even though in the slowing down, we can increase our efficacy and actually overall, therefore, our efficiency. But I think what the planning does is it forces you to organize your thoughts. And I think one of the great myths in successful complex problem solving is that we can keep all the strands of a complex problem in our head. And the reason why I think that is a myth is that Number one, we're trying to solve many things at one time. And number two is, is that we don't necessarily are giving ourselves an opportunity to confront our cognitive biases, those mental mistakes, the assumptions and judgments that we make and that probably don't cost us much in our small decisions, but then don't go away when we're solving for complex problems. Yeah, we're definitely going to come back to biases as we start to unpack the planning process. But I, I guess I want to come back to this point more and more time because I do think that this is critical. And your, my reading your article really reminded me of the, that we seemed in moments of uncertainty, we're going to talk a little bit about emotional response to uncertainty in a minute, but in times of uncertainty, I think you said it exactly right. There's almost a rush to get a plan. And I almost feel like sometimes there's comfort in the plan. We have a plan and therefore it helps us feel com less unsettled by the uncertainty because we now have the certainty of a plan. But as I was reflecting on your comments, I realized, well, that's almost a, a, a false God because if we get fixated on the plan and things then change in our assumptions or interpretation of the uncertainty, and all of a sudden now the plan may be not be that viable, but we're holding on to the plan. We've lost some of the benefit of the planning into the plan. So it sounds almost like the, the plan's great, but kind of remember it was the planning process of bringing all this up that is the benefit of the process. Right, the planning process itself is what's so important. Hopefully you have been able to triangulate and to decrease the amount of uncertainty as you're yeah, trying to figure it. out but, how but, to move forward. But it really is that planning process itself that's very instructive. Now we're gonna come back to this because I think the, one of the ways you think about having really goals and a vision of success, which I wanna come back to as a substitute for a, a very specific rigid plan. But let's go back. I need, we need to unpack one more thing before we get into this, which is you separate uncertainty from ambiguity. And I think for most pe people, that's just the same thing. Um, you know, it's, it's the unknown, it's uh, not a great feeling, uh, if the stakes are high, it can be very unsettling. Will you flesh out the, the difference and the importance in the difference between the two? Yeah, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this because the future is always uncertain and we're never going to get rid of all that uncertainty because we just can't know everything. We can talk to experts and we can do research. And as you mentioned, we can plan so that we decrease some of the uncertainty, but it's not going to go away. But if we can identify what is ambiguous versus what is uncertain, ambiguity is really a matter of interpretation. If something is ambiguous, it lacks clarity and it can be interpreted in a variety of different ways. And this is where you getting clear 
on what I call your vision of success really can be a true north. And from there, you can sit in your values and in that vision of success so that as the uncertainty unfolds or even as new ambiguous pieces of information come forward, you have a much easier time knowing what to say yes to and also when to say no grounded in those values. So as I thought about this difference, and I had, I'm, I'm guilty of just thinking ambiguity and uncertainty, the same thing. And prepping to talk to you really forced me to start to think about them separately. In the last couple of days, I've really been playing with it. And I came to the realization that if I have this, if I can reduce some of the ambiguity of what my ultimate goal is, that it gives me more flexibility to deal with an uncertain path towards that goal. And so I almost felt like the more clear my goal was, as you said, vision of success, the more tolerance I had for the uncertainty on the day-to-day -day as I moved towards that. Is that a fair interpretation? Yeah, I, th I think that's fair. And I think it'd be really good to map an example onto this that I think so many of us may recognize, which is, let's take the example of the fact that as parents, we wanna raise good kids. Well, Nobody knows how to raise good kids, but the truth is, is good kids is ambiguous. What is a good kid? To one family, it might be playing on lots of sports teams. To another family, it might mean that you've got the child who's going to have the best academic grades. For a third family, it might be somebody who's really well connected emotionally, and therefore you prioritize family dinners. So understanding how you define good kids, which is an ambiguous term, is something then that can help you create that vision of success, which is when I'm making a decision, what has to happen in the outcome of the decision for me to know that it has succeeded for me? And the good news is, is you don't have to solve that problem to answer that question. Without even solving it, you probably can invert the problem solving that way to answer what has to happen in the outcome for you to know that it has succeeded. And from there, you could diminish the ambiguity by defining good kid in whichever way you want. So that if you decide, for instance, that family dinners and a child who is somebody who can communicate well and have a very close personal connection is your definition of a good kid, then maybe what you say when the coach of the soccer team says, hey, Junior's got a lot of skill, let's put him or her onto a travel team and that's going to make it impossible for family dinners, then you can, in sitting in those values, be able to say that's not ambiguous for us anymore. We've clarified that. And we're able to say no to the travel sports, which doesn't mean no sports, could mean a local team. And so that's why this idea of delineating between the ambiguity and the uncertainty is something I think people could latch onto and be, have as a practical and actionable tool for them when solving complex problems. Is it fair to say that we wanna to try to reduce the ambiguity of what our goal is or our outcome is and therefore we can deal with some of the uncertainty around other topics or is the ambiguity extend beyond just the goal? I don't think at all it has to be just about the goal. I would say data is something that is often ambiguous. Data can often be interpreted in a variety of ways, which is why in my area method, I have one step of the process, which is really about thinking about the diagnosticity of the evidence that you've collected. And just a quick example of that is right now we're going into stores and everybody's taking our temperature. But the problem is temperature has very little diagnosticity. We don't know what temperature would tell us. And people can be sick without having a temperature. And so the data that we deal with can be ambiguous and the facts, as well as what it is that we're really focused on when we are solving a problem, which is that vision of success tool that you can use to help determine that. You know, it's funny, I went into a store in New York yesterday and they took my temperature and it was 85.6, I was dead. <laughs> I thought, I thought, wow, I wonder what they're doing with that information. Um, so yeah, I think that's a great example. All right, I wanna go back a couple of layers because I just wanna make sure that we get this all organized. All right, go back one more time, vision of success. What does that mean and what role does it play? So traditionally with complex problem solving, you have to start somewhere. And for many people, 
staring down a big decision is something that can be both off-putting and frustrating. Where do you start? How do you look for information? So what my area method says is don't worry about that. Instead, invert the problem and start with what has to happen for the outcome of the, in the outcome of the decision for me to know that it has succeeded for me or my organization personally. And the answer to that question is what I call the vision of success. And from there, once you've come up with that vision of success, so in the family example about good kids, it's kids who are well-rounded and who have a very connected relationship to the parents and siblings as defined by participating in the family dinner. And then from there, once you've answered the question for the vision of success, you can derive what I call your critical concepts, which are the one, two, or three things that you actually need to investigate to solve for the vision of success. Now you no longer have an open-ended complex problem solving process. Instead, you have something that is targeted and focused on what you personally have deemed to be the successful outcome. So now you're setting yourself up for success. Right, so it seems to me the success is gonna be very much personal based, subjective to the decision maker or the organization making the decision. And it sounds like that once we agree on that vision of success, then we have collective buy-in. Which I think is what's so important, right? There's, when, when, you, when it comes to dealing with our decisions, for a long time, we thought of it as something that's siloed, but we never make decisions that only impact us. We always operate in an ecosystem. And so if we recognize that the other stakeholders involved in our decisions have an impact on how successful that decision can be. This idea of vision of success, of critical concepts, these are tools that you can use where again, you're creating a common lexicon. You're also establishing what I call situationality, which is the understanding in the ecosystem itself and you're building community, which I think are three very important things to help make our decisions as successful as possible seems to me that if I can get those three things working for my organization or my family or my group, or common goals, this lexicon, the buy-in, and then the ultimate goal, that true north, it feels like the entire team can deal with more uncertainty because we're not going to lose our way given some incre piece, incremental piece of information, whether it's valid or not, because if it's not a step towards that vision, then we can, I'm not saying ignore it, but we certainly can perhaps diminish its impact on our, our next step. Is that an okay so, way? So I would say yes and no on that. The critical concepts are meant for you to zero in on. What are the one, two, or three things that you need to investigate to solve for that vision of success? And I say one, two, or three, because generally in complex problem solving, we may have eight, nine, 10 different factors, but really only one, two, or three are the most important. You're not trying to investigate every factor and you're not trying to investigate them all equally because most likely you have preferences and you have priorities. But once you've established that vision of success, the area method guides you on a research process to look from one perspective at a time. So it's really the opposite of Google, right? And traditionally, we have a problem, we type it into Google and immediately we're in all perspectives at the same time. We don't know how to listen to these other voices as they've come up on our computer screen. And we tend to listen to the loudest voices, the ones on the top without any sense of their incentives or their motives or where they're coming from or whether or not they might frame a problem as we do. So by using a system that breaks down our information from one perspective at a time, each of the different stakeholders have an opportunity to be heard and it also pushes us out of our own perspective, which gives us the opportunity to more easily check and challenge our assumptions and judgments. And so through that process, you could have other pieces of information that maybe you didn't think were so important that kind of bubble up and that you recognize that you were making assumptions going in. And that's why looking from the various stakeholder perspectives helps you to better see and understand the different types of information and to pry open that cognitive space to be able to hear them. 
I think for most people, I certainly fall in this camp that when I'm faced with uncertainty, my first reaction is just get more information. Um, and I'm, I'm I've got myself pretty convinced that the more information I get, the more I'll reduce that uncertainty. And as I reduce that uncertainty, the decision will be easier. Um, but you have a different take on it, right? I do. I don't necessarily think that you want the most information. You do want to have a process that's targeted and focused. But what I find in working with companies and individuals and so on is oftentimes they're willing to do some data collection, but then they tend to skip over the investment in themselves that is the analysis piece. Asking themselves very simply, so what? What does it mean? And so they collect information, but then it just sort of passes them by. It's in a file, but they haven't really gestated and put together a thesis statement, so to speak, from the information that basically says, what do I think I found? What does it mean? What's my judgment or interpretation based on that? And then what is it pointing me to do next in my research process? We've lived through certainly a couple of years, but this year maybe more than most, where this idea of fake news and alternative facts and have entered in. Um, I think a lot of people think facts are facts and, and data is data, so it all should just be interpreted similarly. You were a, you were a prize-winning journalist and uh, you have tremendous respect in the research community. You don't view all data as innocent. Well, I think, you know, we have to understand what's behind the data, whether it's the construction of the consumer price index, or I was reading an interesting article that I think was in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago about how we're getting to this 3% number, for instance, for the New York City public schools that are impacting so many families right now. And um, why understanding what's at the denominator really makes a difference in terms of how they understand what population it's impacting and whether or not that's relevant when we're really thinking about keeping kids in the public school system. And so I do think if you are gonna use a number that becomes very important in your decision-making, understanding where and how that came to be and whether or not it's relevant for you. Just one quick example in the college landscape, since we're here talking to the Columbia Alumni Network, is this idea of the US News and World Report lists and other lists that talk about the best colleges. Well, if you actually look at what is involved in what they use to comprise the rankings, they use things like professor salaries, they might even use at times what's happening with the endowment. These may be important factors, but if you're a student applying to a school, I don't know that that's your criteria. I don't know if that would help you rank a school higher. And so I do think that all of us building a bit of an internal compass to get comfortable with questioning data that becomes important to us is something that can help us feel, I think, that we have greater agency over our decisions. All right, this is, we've had a discussion, looks like for about 20 minutes, we've gone very quickly into a lot of detail. I'm gonna step back now, now that we've warmed everything up and see if we can use the tools. And I think the example you gave a moment ago about New York City schools and COVID is an excellent one that I wanna play with now. We've warmed these up, we've thrown in some vocabulary. Let's try to piece this together. Um, the, it seems to me that there's enormous ambiguity. I am not a parent of children. My children are educated, thank the good Lord, um, and they're on their own and they're paying their own rent. But I can imagine, I did raise my children in the city, so I have a lot of empathy. It's, so I'm gonna use your vocabulary against a real world example. It seems to me as a consumer of that information, if I had children, that the goal is incredibly ambiguous. I can't tell what Mayor de Blasio and the Board of Education is trying to maximize here. Is it safety for the city, safety for the children, safety for the teachers, safety for my child? So for me, when I read these headlines, and now I'm not a parent, but I, can, I was not that long ago, I read these and think, I have no idea what the goal of the exercise is. So that to me seems incredibly ambiguous. Is that a fair interpretation of the situation? I have to say, since I don't have kids in the New York City 
public schools since I don't live in New York City. I don't know exactly what criteria they're using, but it does seem like there are a lot of articles that raise a lot of different questions about aspects that they're dealing with. And I don't know how the families that have followed this very closely feel or the knowledge that they have. But when you think about some of the factors that they're probably thinking about, whether it is the safety of the teachers and the safety of the students and thinking about then what comprises quality education and, and also the hardship on families of are we on or are we off and when do we shut down? I don't know how they think about the priorities and, the, and how they've defined their vision of success. And I do think that in the years to come, as we have a chance to do studies on how we made decisions in this period, um, I, I think a lot more will come to light that will probably help us all in the future as we have to navigate more things that are just unexpected. And I, it's not an issue that's personally interesting because I don't have children, but it's something I've taken a lot of interest in because I'm fascinated by the decision making around it. And I, I've read enough and seen enough interviews of parents that the ambiguity appears to be incredibly high. Um, and I'm using that word specifically because there, the, the parents can say, I don't understand what they're trying to maximize for, and therefore it's hard for me to judge whether or not the decisions make sense. So that would be ambiguity. The uncertainty that then I see is factors that go in again. I, now I'm very ambiguous, but I, I, I can kind of think what de Blasio is trying to do. He's trying to keep people safe. He wants to deliver high quality education. So I can, I can, I can kind of make the ambiguity go away a little bit. But then the uncertainty for me is trying to anticipate what the dis next decision will be made by the people that have all the power is based on infection rates and um, uh, uh, contagion in the city. And so that to me is the uncertainty. So as a parent, I, I feel like I have ambiguity because I can't figure out what they're trying to get to. And I have a lot of uncertainty as the data that's coming in. Is that a, a fair way of looking at this problem using your structure? Well, I do think that there's both uncertainty and ambiguity. And I think that they recognize that every time they make a decision, they also then have to pivot quickly as the facts on the ground change. And when you're making very large systemic decisions, having a lot of flexibility it seems to me that's become the real problem for them is they wanna be flexible, being open and being closed if they need to be. And yet they seem to some extent having difficulty doing both and giving any certainty to families that are in such a difficult position as the city is making quick changes in response to data that they're getting. So yes. All right, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, very helpful. All right, now we, we we set this up at the beginning. New Year's coming, 30 days away, not quite 30 days away. And for a lot of people that marks the milestone. We write new numbers in, in our calendars and on our checks if we still write checks. So it, it is a movement to a new number. Um, it seems for me that the uncertainty going into the new year, economic, the markets, uh, restaurants in New York, the uncertainty is as high today as it's been any time in the last eight and a half months that we've been dealing with this. So the uncertainty seems high, it, but the ambiguity for me is, it seems I would have to think about what goals I have for 2021 for myself, my family, my business, my organization, that I need, it, I need to start develop. If I'm going into the new year and trying to plan for the new year, I should start developing visions of success for the year. It may be a one-year plan. It may be a six-month plan, a three-month plan. That would give me some clarity around what I want to achieve, even though I probably can't reduce the uncertainty on infection rates and restaurant openings and closings and other things is that is as we start to think is that a way that our listeners can start to use these tools for themselves absolutely i mean we we're not going to know what next year is going to look like but we also don't know what the next few minutes are going to look like and so taking control of our decisions since when you think about it the only thing that we have control over are our choices 
taking control of those and building our confidence and conviction that we can actually solve complex problems for ourselves is something that can really make our dreams and our goals seem much more accessible because they do begin then to lay out a path step by step. So in thinking about the kinds of decisions that people may have for next year, whether it's for their business or where they're gonna live or what kind of job they might have to be looking for now and so on, um, using this vision of success tool and then deriving those critical concepts can become something that then can lead you down a research pathway where you're getting much closer to the kinds of things that you can know and whether or not those things really are something that makes you want to make that decision because you're never going to be able to have a future where you know what is going to happen and research tells us we're not actually that good at predicting our future happiness as well. So if we can take our decisions and actually develop the critical concepts and the vision of success, we can begin the research process to evaluate what information we can collect and how it matches with what we ourselves have deemed to be a successful outcome for a decision that we're thinking about. All right, one more thing we need to talk about, and then I, th I think we'll have some time for some questions from the audience, and that is this notion of biases. And I think that uh, I've certainly learned over the years that I have biases, all kinds of biases. I, the day doesn't go by where I'm not exposed to my biases in decision making. Uh, can you talk a little bit about biases, how they play in this role, and what's kind of the best way to counter bias? Okay, so, you know, researchers tell us we make close to 10,000 decisions a day. As a matter of fact, I read from a Cornell University study, we make over 200 decisions a day about food alone. And so if we didn't have these cognitive biases, which basically teach us things based on the past and our experience, if we didn't have those, it would really trip up our day. Can you imagine if we walked into a supermarket into the cereal aisle and we didn't remember where our favorite cereal was located or what color it was, all of a sudden we'd be opened up to all of the choices of that aisle and to everything in the supermarket. And the average supermarket in the United States has about 40,000 items. So we need these cognitive biases for our everyday activities. But when it comes to complex problem solving, they act like a dirty windshield on the world. We don't know that they are there and that they may be constricting our thinking or that they may be prioritizing certain pieces of information just based on the past experience. And so having a way to pry open that cognitive space to face our assumptions and our judgments against evidence, that is something that can really help us to grow as decision makers and to move forward in the world in a way that has a more close picture to reality than the way that we've been operating to date. All right, let's boil this down to a bit more layman's terms. So we all have natural biases and we're not really, I don't think we're thinking the big biases, the big uh, whether or not we have certain prejudices. We're really talking about the way we interpret information um, and the way we process information because it's, we're not making 200 decisions about food in the sense of big giant decisions, whether we're gonna be vegetarian or we're gonna be carnivore. We're really talking about whether we're gonna have a ham sandwich or we're gonna have a salad. And then with the salad, whether we're gonna get the tomatoes and whether we're gonna get the French dry, right. You're talking about these little micro decisions every day. And the good news is that we have this apparatus that makes it easy for us to do it. They're not necessarily optimal and it doesn't matter. But that same apparatus, when we try to apply it to a decision like buy a new home, change careers, move to a new city, open a restaurant, close a restaurant, that's where our biases may trip us up. They work really well for those micro decisions because the impact's pretty small. You know, you get the French dressing, I should have gotten the Italian, you go on with life, right? But if I move to Boston rather than stay in New York, that has a much bigger consequences. And now if I have these biases seeping in and I don't fully realize it, I may make a decision that has a big ramifications. That's, that's exactly a, right. 
That's right. We want these biases in, in many ways in our everyday. Um, just a couple popular examples would be optimism bias. We expect that it's going to work out well. Or the liking bias where we tend to give greater weight to the opinions and thoughts of somebody who we have respect for or somebody who we like. Or confirmation bias, which I think is another one of these great myths of complex problem solving, where we tend to go out and look to confirm things that we think we know, as opposed to thinking about, can we disconfirm that piece of information? Or the reciprocity bias where, Somebody's done something nice for us. And so we feel like we should do something nice for them automatically, sometimes without even really thinking that, you know, the gift that came in the mail from the nonprofit organization is a gift because it's hoping that we're going to make a donation to them. Yeah, I think uh, um, I have a, in my investment class, we talk a lot about biases and it's a little bit like being in medical school, you, uh, you you suffer every disease as you learn it. And every year when I teach them, I'm reminded of my confirmation bias, my salient bias, my reciprocity bias, my likingness bias. <laughs> uh, you, know, you go with the facts that are easiest to get because those, those are the easiest to do, which I think is great. Um, uh, one of the questions that came up that I will paraphrase because I think it's applicable to everybody is somebody said you know, they're looking potentially to change jobs. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through with you and uh, maybe I'll input a little bit on how we should think about job offers. So let's just make it really concrete. We're out looking for a new job and we actually have multiple job offers. We can stay in our current job or we have two other job offers and they're very different from each other and they're very different from our own. You had mentioned earlier that we humans don't do a good job of projecting our future happiness. So how would you go about if you had, you could stay in your current job, which is good, not blow away, good. Um, and you have these two that sound great, but we have a lot of uncertainty. How, how, how do we unpack that one? Well, first, it's wonderful to have multiple offers. That's a good problem. <laughs> okay, so whoever wrote that, I, I congratulate you because clearly you are very skilled. Um, so what I would start off with is this vision of success. If you've made the right decision, what's happened? Right? Are you making more money? Are you spending more time with your family? Are you using your current skills? Are you developing a new set of skills? Are you gonna get to travel if and when the world reopens? I don't know what your vision of success would be, but answering that question is a first starting point. And from there- so please, wait, 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 wait. I like that. We're gonna just stop for a minute. I wanna make sure that's saying it. All right, so I have a couple of offers. I could stay where I am. I could go to job A or job B, right? And so you say my first step is I really should spend a moment and say, what does that success look like when I have the new job? Maybe I really want to advance my career so I don't mind working hard. Maybe even the pay is not great, but the, the skill development, the opportunity for promotion is huge. Maybe somebody else is saying, no, I'm about to get married or I'm about to have kids and I actually want to be able to have a very fulfilling job, but a job has deadline. I mean, I could turn it off at night right. or on the weekend. So what I really want to be able to do is carve out the weekends and spend time to raise my young children. For somebody else, maybe it is, I really want to move to another town. The job's not that as important. I want a good job. I want something that pays, but the ability to move to a new job. So, so you would say first thing is to really step away from the offers. And, right, and I think, Paul, you said that so beautifully because the answer for one person is not going to be the answer for another person, even if they're looking at the same data. And that's why this vision of success becomes so important, right? Because it is really getting clear on what is success for you personally or for your organization. So once I have that and I reduce the ambiguity of what I'm trying to achieve in the decision, and now I have a much clearer idea, now all of a sudden I have a framework to deal with. I, I definitely have limited information, almost by definition, right? I have somewhat limited but it could influence the questions I ask in the interview or in the follow-up call, because then I can map that against what my vision of success looks like. That's right. So let's say that the new job offer that your priority is, is you want to get, um, you want to have something where you're developing a new set of skills. You, you've enjoyed what you're doing, but you're really ready for growth. And so, as you said, you might have then as your critical concepts, 
How is how will the different opportunities help me grow? Now, notice you'd have to define what growth is. Is growth something where you are working with a lot of new and different um, types of people from a variety of different um, parts of a business, for instance? So now all of a sudden you can see across an organization. Or is growth something where you're really going to go deep in one area? And so you can see now how the critical concepts feed out of the vision of success. You're taking basically the nouns from that vision of success and they become pretty much what will be your critical concepts that you'll put into a question that is researchable. And you'll take one, two or three of those so that you can investigate, well, what kind of growth do I want? And then it might also be, okay, if I'm ready for a new challenge and I wanna grow, what does that mean in terms of the number of hours that I'm willing to work? And so now you could investigate for the three different options, for instance, is it a 60 hour work week? Is it an 80 hour work week? Is it one of these things where I'm never off, for instance? And a third critical concept might be, is my family in a stage where if I do want to step up and really grow personally, what is that going to mean for how that changes how I can be with them? Now, that's obviously criteria that I've made up, but you can see that from there, you can funnel those critical concepts into the different steps of area, which is an acronym for the steps of my process and the perspectives that it runs through, and you can investigate what each of those things mean from each of the stakeholder perspectives so that you can work towards an outcome that will show you how these options stack up against what you've determined to be success. Okay, great. So we've done this. We've, uh, I've, I've done a good job of defining my vision of success, come up with three criteria that I think are really important to that success. Now I get some buy-in with other, in this case, maybe other family members or I'm in a relationship, whatever that is, so that we've all kind of bought into the vision and we understand what that is. Now I can go and actually do research to find out. But I am an optimist. I always think the train, you know, when you go to the bank, don't have me plan the bank robbery because I'm assuming that the guards are not gonna be very competent. I'm assuming there's gonna be no traffic. The lights are gonna turn. I'm gonna assume the best case. So I'm terrible at this. So in this case, it seems to me that you, as an individual, as you're making this decision, you should be aware of your own natural biases because that may influence what information you collect or how you interpret the information. When they say, oh, it's not, no, the hours aren't that bad. I go, oh, great, the hours aren't that bad. Well, you might say, well, no, no, you might get more information on that. You know, not too bad, meaning 80 hours a week, um, or as you said, you know, answer every email within 15 minutes, even if it's in the middle of the night. I mean, is it that not too bad, right? So it seems that as we start to get that, that we also need to be careful of our own natural biases and we start to interpret the information that we use to make the decision. So I think what we should do is really lay out for people, what is the area method as a system? Great. So area moves your work from bias to objectivity in part by separating out the different stakeholder perspectives as I was describing before. The first A in area is absolute information. That's information from up close on the target of your decision. And so if you are looking at a couple different options for how to grow your business, or you're looking at a couple different job opportunities, those opportunities or the growth opportunities for the business person, those would be your absolute targets. And you'd sit in their perspective, you would understand their value proposition. And then from there, you would also investigate about whatever their products and services are. The next concentric circle of areas, relative information. Those are sources that are somehow connected to the decision targets, but not from the targets itself. It's basically putting your decision into context. In the job situation, after looking directly from the three different organizations that are giving you this potential new opportunity, in relative information, you would learn a little bit more about how those jobs sit in their ecosystem. Well, is the job as it's described at the places where you're reviewing it, are those normal descriptions of it? How does the salary stack up in the broader industry? Would I be going into an area that is in a growing industry or might it be in an industry that's being disintermediated? What do the experts have to say? What do the academicians have to say? 
The third step, area E, is about getting beyond document-based research to upgrade your research by either broadening what you understand by interviewing people, that's area exploration. And so there you reach out directly to people to check what you've learned to actually better understand it and to have conversations. And then in area exploitation, you would step back and you would assess your assumptions against evidence with a couple of creative exercises that I've learned from experts in other fields such as the intelligence community or the medical community or even investigative journalism. So what Paul was just saying about 60 hours, is that real? Or might they be saying that because it's really 80 hours and they really don't have the heart to tell you 80 hours? Once you've gotten beyond the documents in area exploration, you'd be able to find out, well, is that actually your experience to somebody who's held that position before maybe, or to somebody who knows that company, or to somebody who even works at that company now? And then in the final step of area, the final A analysis, that's when you really strength test your decision. And you think about failure, how might that decision fail before you've even made it? And the reason why that's so powerful is you have an opportunity to tell the story of failure, which shows you where are their weaknesses even before you've made the decision that could cause that decision to fail? And then how can you set up some scaffolding to protect the decision from failing in the ways that you've identified? And that also gives you a way to evaluate after the decision, whether or not it's been successful by holding yourself accountable so that you won't have evolving hypotheses. It sounds like the process can be I'm not going to say exhausting, but it can be certainly time and energy consuming. Is it fair to say that when I'm going down the cereal aisle to pick the cereal that I probably don't need to do the area method, I'm probably okay. But if I'm going to make a big decision, start a business, go back to school, change cities, change jobs in a big way, that the planning process, the outcome has got much greater consequences. Therefore, the planning process should be equally as thoughtful because the outcomes so, are so impact, potentially impactful. So that's exactly right. I generally describe a good decision for area is something that I call high stakes. And I define high stakes by three components. The outcome is unknown, which is true for all decisions, right? The second one is that it is going to have a long-term impact. And the third is that the price for getting it wrong is costly. When you have a decision that meets those three criteria, that's when I think you really benefit from using a system for complex problem solving. So these kinds of decisions, taking a job, deciding how to be able to move forward with less, which is a terrible question that so many people are dealing with, whether or not to have my children sign up for fully online education, as opposed to having them go in person. These are all such high stakes decisions where we're actually slowing down to speed up the efficacy and the efficiency of what we're doing by making the investment in ourselves. So it really is that the planning process is an investment early on so that the out, we increase the odds, the chances of being successful. We increase, in right. We want to increase our confidence that we are going to solve our problems in a way that's going to be successful for us and in a way that it's built on a collaborative backbone that is actively working to strengthen our relationships as we're solving our problem. Is it, is it fair to say that uh, because of biases uh, and we make so many micro decisions a day that we, as humans, we become a bit overconfident in our ability to make decisions. And then that's when we get to a complex decision, that overconfidence, we sort of, we think we can wing it. We think we can just guess. We think we can. One of the, one of the questions was, you know, isn't that aren't we susceptible to the path of least resistance just because it's easier, cognitively easier, less energy? So I, I think that's another good myth, which is um, I just want it to be easy or I just want it to be over because what you really want hopefully is to have a more successful future for you personally. But I would say that what I've identified 
is that there's really five different kinds of decision-making archetypes. And I developed this digital tool that I call the Problem Solver Profile, which helps people to self-identify into one of these five different archetypes. And they are adventurers, listeners, detectives, visionaries, and thinkers. And so within those different archetypes, I find that they really tend to fall prey to different types of biases. So for the adventurer, they do tend to just want to go with their gut, get it over with, move on, and have the next decision before them. But for the listener, he or she may be somebody who actively wants to go out and seek other people's opinions to the point where they have almost analysis paralysis because they've had so much good input that it's hard to know what to do with it. And so using a system like AREA is gonna keep you moving forward and it's gonna show you what does that term research actually mean? Because most decision-making systems out there, they basically say do research as if it's a single step. But as many people know, instead it's actually a whole series of very tricky steps that need to be thoughtfully and carefully navigated. And so having a way to do that is what really helps you to check and challenge those biases. So it sounds like if I'm going to make a high stakes decision that's going to affect my organization or my family, I should get more people involved in the process because I'm going to bring different biases, um, give everybody a voice and we can get a buy in and then people will really aim at it. We can deal with we're reducing the ambiguity. We can deal with probably more uncertainty. And we can be more flexible as the world continues to change, which is going to be the case. Um, is that a fair way to think about biases? Bring I would some other say it's, it's, I, I would say that with organizations that I've dealt with, even those that really um, prioritize intellectual diversity, I often find that companies tend to hire uh, one very dominant group. Um, for one reason or another, but that intellectual diversity really does give you a way to see that there are very different ways to approach a problem, that one way is not better than the other, and that if we can listen and learn from these other approaches, that we can increase our own critical thinking, and therefore we can see more perspectives and maybe even be a little bit more innovative. I wanna just note one question that I see here that says, should we not live in a moment and put less emphasis on planning the future? I think that we do wanna live in the moment, but there are certain decisions that are going to have a long-term impact on us and where the price for getting it wrong is really costly. And then I think it does make sense to try to figure out what's important to us. Why are we solving this decision? What are we solving it for? And so it doesn't have to be that it takes so much time. You can customize area to pick and choose the parts that you want, even though in the book, both books, I go through, what does it look like if you apply the whole system? And I think even that process of applying it even once and this idea of getting clear on a vision of success, you can use that in a moment. What am I solving for? Well, unfortunately, this has been fantastic. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I could talk to you for the next hour, Cheryl. Um, I'm taking notes. I'm learning. Uh, I thought I was an expert in the area, but you showed me that I'm not as much of an expert as I thought, uh, which is great for me. Um, but I certainly want to thank you. I know you've been, you spent 20 years thinking about these things and continue to think about it. You've written two terrific books, a bunch of articles. You teach students all the time. You're obviously a natural teacher and you want people to learn. So thank you for sharing it with us. I can't imagine a more relevant time to just pause and see how we're going to get through this uncertainty collectively, individually. So that is great. I certainly want to thank the audience. I know, uh, uh, it's this enormous stress on every family in the country. Um, even if you've been fortunate, there's stress of what tomorrow will bring. So we really appreciate you taking the time to connect with the Columbia community. It's an extremely valuable community. It's a diverse community and hearing from everybody has just been great. Um, I just want to point out, this is uh, uh, the Columbia at Homes, an ongoing series to connect with the alumni and bring thoughtful topics, timely topics. So next week, uh, Columbia at Home, will present a virtual tour of the latest edition, I'm sorry, exhibition at the Columbia Wallach Art Gallery.
Uptown Triennial 2020 is the name of the show, with director and chief curator Betty, C Betty Sue Hertz and artist Xavier um, Simmons. There'll be a special introduction by Carol Becker, Dean of Columbia University School of the Arts. So that's next Wednesday, same time, December 9, seven o'clock, same time. Uh, you can register at alumni.columbia.edu, which is where you can register for all the event. And I thank you. I know Cheryl, you'll thank you. And I know everybody thank at you CAA so much. thanks you guys. And thank you, Columbia and community. Thank you. To a happy, healthy new year to everybody.